Uh, I'm Steven Johnson, and I write books and create TV shows and podcasts about the history and future of innovation. When you're wrestling with a complicated decision in your business, when you're really thinking about something that might have a kind of a multi-year kind of long-term impact, you know, should we launch this new product? Um, should we go into this new market? Um, in a sense, what you're doing in that moment with that kind of decision making is predicting the future, right? You, you're looking at the current state of things, all the different variables. This is our given product line. This is our market. This is where we think the economy is going. And you're trying to take all that data and make a prediction about what will happen a year or two down the line uh, if you do make this particular choice. And I think most of the time when people face decisions like that, they do it kind of intuitively. Like they sit around and talk about it a little bit and they weigh it and they think about it in the shower and then they make the call. But we actually know quite a bit about prediction and our ability to model complicated systems and anticipate what might happen down the line. Um, there's been a lot of interesting kind of psychological research into this. And one of the things that we've learned is that, it, you know, if people create time and think about the decision-making process as a process that goes through different steps, um, that they can actually come up with better results, better, better outcomes for the decisions they make. And one of those steps is this prediction phase, right, where you gather a bunch of people around and in a sense you tell stories, right? You tell stories about what might happen over the next two or three years if we launch this product or if we enter this new market. And the goal of it is to get a range of different stories, um, to force people to really think about the unanticipated consequences or something they're missing, something that's in a blind spot in their field of vision that keeps them from seeing uh, the full scope of possible futures that are out there. And one way you can do that is just get a lot of interesting people in the room, people maybe who are new to this particular field, don't know your product, get some outsiders in there so you have fresh eyes on the problem, and literally ask people to tell stories. You know, imagine a scenario where this goes really badly. What would happen in that scenario? Imagine this product becomes a huge hit. Why does it become a huge hit? And through having a range of different perspectives, you get, in a sense, a range of forecasts that are available to you. And it enables you to kind of understand the landscape better and, and, and hopefully unlock some new ideas about where the product should go or where you're vulnerable to competition from, from other firms. At some point, we may have computers that will help us make those forecasts, right? We have computers that are great at weather forecasts now. Um, computers are getting better at economic forecasts. But I think the most important tool right now is the collective intelligence, not of a supercomputer that is you know, doing weather forecasts for your business, but the collective intelligence of an interesting group of people that you've assembled telling stories about where your product might be in a, in a year or two. That's, that's one of the most important tools we have for making complicated decisions at work. I think we have a bias when we think about progress in technology towards, in a sense, kind of shiny objects, right? We, we like to look at the, you know, I've got this smartphone and it's amazing, it's right here in front of me. Um, and we don't tend to focus sometimes on the things that are equally momentous and involved equally innovative thinking, but that don't seem quite as high tech. Um, and to me, one of the most impressive ones, maybe the most important one uh, in history, is the complex of technologies that came together to enable people in large cities to drink water without facing major health risks. I mean, if we rewound the clock just 150 years in any big city in the world, people were dying from waterborne diseases because the water just wasn't safe to drink. And it was a major threat to human life, and particularly to young children who would die at terrible rates back just a century or so ago. And we had to solve that problem by understanding scientific breakthroughs about the nature of bacteria in water, understanding chemical breakthroughs about how you could chlorinate drinking water, engineering breakthroughs about how you could build sewer systems and water delivery systems that were safe and reservoirs and all these things. All these problems had to be solved in using multiple disciplines and huge numbers of people. But what they created was uh, a, a really a new way of living, right? It was very hard to have a million people gathered into one urban space and have it not be incredibly dangerous. 
Uh, now we're building cities with 20 million people. And it's because of that underlying platform of solving the problem of drinking water in a, in a large, dense urban area that we're able to do that. And, uh, you know, you don't look at a glass of water and say, this is an amazing technological innovation, but maybe we should. The question I get a lot is, can you teach innovative thinking? You know, is this something that you're just born with, they're creative people, and then there are people who are not creative? Or is this something that you can learn? And I, I come down very much on the side that it is something you can learn. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of organizing the world around you. It's a way of organizing the space of your office. Um, it's a way of organizing the flows of information that, that come to you. And it's a and kind of an attitude and an orientation towards the world that you can adopt. Um, if you if you follow a few kind of reliable steps, um, one key ingredient of that innovator's mindset is an openness to new experiences. Um, that that may be one of the most fundamental definitions of it. You are not narrowly focused on one thing, um, and when new ideas, new developments, new technological um, breakthroughs, new hobbies, um, strange things that your kids bring home from school that you, you know, look bizarre because they're your kid's generation, not your generation. You can react to those new experiences by saying, I don't know what that is and it seems weird to me so I'm just going to avoid it or dismiss it. Or you can say, well that's interesting. Well, tell me more about that. And it's people who kind of lean into those new ideas, who have a kind of natural curiosity or at least a, a learned curiosity. They really make sure that they're open to those new experiences and embrace them and try and learn about them. The, those are the people that I think in the long run end up being the most innovative. Um, there's a great, I've, I've heard from a number of firms. So one question is how do you cultivate that innovative mindset in your organization, right? You've got a mid-sized business. You've got, let's say, 100, 200, 300 employees. What do you do to, to cultivate that sense of openness and curiosity? And I've seen some companies that uh, they like to have a, a Monday meeting where you know central teams get together and they basically play a game of show and tell, which I think is adorable because it's basically indistinguishable from kindergarten. But people come in and say, hey, this weekend I went and saw this interesting new sculpture exhibit at the museum here. My kid brought in this crazy robotic doll from Japan that I thought was pretty interesting. And it doesn't have to be related directly to the official business of the company itself. Um, but it creates a culture where people realize that those outside influences, um, those ideas that you know are coming from another culture or from another field or from the world of art and creativity, those ideas might very well have the seed of something new that is relevant to the business. And it's precisely by kind of diversifying your inputs, right? Diversifying the flows of information coming to you so that you're getting inspired by a much wider range of, of, of the culture. That is a, a key recipe for success in terms of innovative thinking. And it's something that is set in a sense at the level of the organization itself, right? This is, we, we, we're establishing here by playing this game of show and tell once a week that we're a company that knows that inspiration is going to come from the least likely place. It's going to come from outside this office. And so we want you to bring those ideas in. We want to hear about your hobbies. We want to hear about the things that you were stimulated by this weekend when you went to the movies or you went to see a, a, a play or an art gallery. Those, those outside influences are a great opportunity for us. We can find new ideas in the collisions between the work we're doing at our desks and that outer world of influence.